So I would like to uh, present a brief review of motivational interviewing and the core skill of reflective listening and how we can use that skill in our lobby meetings. I want to thank Elizabeth Dell and Brett Cease, Jen Tyler and Vince Shutt for helping me to pull this together and helping me to curate my jokes. <laughs> so it's easy to think about lobbying as if it were a game like tennis. The ball comes at you and you give it a good whack and then it goes back in the opposite direction. Like your member of Congress says, I do not support this policy. And you give that a kind of like an intellectual whack and then their thought process just reverses in the other direction. And they say, yes, I do support that policy. I do, I do. But lobbying is not like that. I think lobbying is more subtle, like the sport of curling. You all know curling? You know, this stone gets launched on the ice towards a target, and two people run ahead of it with brooms, sweeping the ice. And the idea is that they can subtly influence the speed and direction of the stone by sweeping in front of it. And I think our members of Congress are kind of like those stones. <laughs> they have their own speed and direction, and we can't significantly change that. But we, what we can hope to do is to subtly influence their speed and direction. And I think motivational interviewing can give us the skills to exert that kind of subtle influence. Subtle influence might not sound like a lot to you, but if you exert subtle influence skillfully, it can lead to Olympic gold. Now, the brilliant MI trainer in Canada, Vince Schott, who's worked a lot with CCL, introduced this concept, and he calls it the MI band of emotions. And he says that to practice motivational interviewing, you have to be coming from within this particular emotional range. And that includes empathy, acceptance, curiosity, and compassion. If you're coming from this place, then the techniques of MI will flow naturally. If you're not coming from this place, the techniques won't make any difference. It's not always easy for us to access all of this, but Vince says we have to at least access curiosity in order to make motivational interviewing work. So last summer I got this idea that I would put Vince's idea to some sort of a test. I wanted to come up with a way to scientifically test the real world impact of the MI band of emotions. So first of all, how many of you are familiar with the En-ROADS computer simulator? Great, a lot of you, very good. So, so En-ROADS, for those of you who don't know, was developed by some folks at MIT, and this is a computer climate solution simulator. So you can play with all these sliders at the bottom and you can look at what if we had more renewable energy or more nuclear power, various things, and see how those changes will affect global temperatures over time. So what I did last summer was I built a supercomputer in my own home out of various <laughs> objects I found in my kitchen. <laughs> and then using that, I created a, my own climate simulator. And I call this M-ROADS <laughs> because it measures the impact of various emotions on global temperatures over time. So here's how Emrose calculated the status quo. Here's where we are. <laughs> so globally, we have high levels of anger, contempt, hatred, and fear. And Emrose projects that this will lead to a 3.8 degrees Celsius rise. <laughs> by the end of the century. So I asked M. Rhodes to project what would happen if we substituted the MI band of emotions. And you know, I thought my machine might break. It started shaking and smoke came out of it and it made weird noises, but it did eventually come up with a result. <laughs> Thank you.
M. Rhodes projects that high levels of empathy, acceptance, curiosity, and compassion implemented globally <laughs> will keep global temperature rise below two degrees Celsius by the end of the century. And we can do even better as we pass effective climate legislation. <laughs> now, since we're a science-based organization, I have to confess that the MROADS model has not yet been peer-reviewed. <laughs> so this is what I believe, and I invite you to believe it with me. <laughs> Empathy, acceptance, curiosity, and compassion are foundational to our work. And I think we can consider these emotions a climate solution in themselves, and you could put them on your climate action to-do list which might look something like this. One, call Congress. Two, get heat pump. Three, practice empathy, acceptance, curiosity, and compassion. <laughs> now, I want to talk a little bit about the core skill of reflective listening, which is uh, a, a motivational interviewing, which is reflective listening. And I'm going to focus on these two elements, open-ended questions and reflections. So open-ended questions are simply questions you cannot answer with a simple yes or no. And the idea is to elicit what the other person thinks and feels. And a reflection is you paraphrase, in your own words, in an, emp an empathic way, non-judgmentally, your own understanding of what they're saying as you imagine their point of view to be. Now, a reflection requires us to do two things, and they're both essential. The first step is to listen for understanding. You have to listen to the other person to form a non-judgmental view of what they're saying, empathically, right? Trying to put yourself in their shoes. Try to see this issue from their point of view. If you don't complete this first step, which is internal, you should really not go on to the second step. So this is the first step, and it's essential. The second step is to offer a reflection by saying out loud how you understand them. Right? This is a way of checking your understanding. You tell them what you understand that they're saying, and this will prompt them to say more. Now, um, to make it easier for you to offer reflections, you could use this handle, what I hear you saying is. But I want to warn you again, this technique is not going to make any difference if you're in the wrong emotional place. If you're not coming from a place of empathy, if you've not made a genuine effort to understand this person from their point of view and without judgment, you really don't want to go down this road. Because if, you, if you're feeling angry at them or you think that they're stupid or wrong and you say, what I hear you saying is, um, what's going to come out next is just going to be hurtful to this conversation. So you have to complete step one. You have to go to that place of empathy. Your understanding doesn't have to be correct necessarily, but you have to be genuine in your effort to understand them non-judgmentally. And if you've done that, then you could say, what I hear you saying is, and then put it out there. Bill Miller and Stephen Rolnick, who developed motivational interviewing, once wrote, the starting point for understanding motivational interviewing is understanding that it is possible to communicate in a way that elicits change talk and thereby nudges a person towards change. So what is this change talk? It's at the very heart of motivational interviewing. So a simple way to understand change talk is that it is any talk about the advantages of change or the disadvantages of the status quo. Anything the other person says that shows the advantages of change or the disadvantages of the status quo. And for our purposes, that means the advantages of passing climate-friendly legislation or the disadvantages of not doing so. So let's look at some examples of how we might do this. 
Oh, I'm sorry, before we get to some examples, when we use our open-ended questions and reflections to evoke change talk, it's like using a highlighter in a text. When you highlight a text, you're not adding anything to the text. You're simply em emphasizing the most important points of the text. So we're listening to what our members of Congress are saying, and we're listening for what we think is most important. And what is that? We're listening for anything that they say which might indicate what, what they think is the advantage of passing this legislation or the disadvantage of not doing so. And this process of finally discriminating between what we think is important, right, what we're gonna reflect, what we're gonna tune in on, and what we're gonna disregard, this is how we sweep the ice. This is how we subtly guide that stone towards its target. So let's look at some specific examples. Now these are both open-ended questions. What are your concerns about the Prove-It Act? Or what do you like about the Prove-It Act? Now when you ask what are your concerns, what are you asking for? You're asking the person to speak negatively about the Prove-It Act, right? You can see the stone starting to veer away from the target. When you ask what do you like about the Prove-It Act, they start talking about, right, the benefits of it. And very subtly, that stone heads towards the target. What about these two? How do you think energy permitting reform would benefit your district or state? Or what problems do you see with the current permitting process? Actually, these both evoke change talk. The first question asks, what do you think are the advantages to passing permitting reform? And the second one asks, what are the disadvantages of not doing so? Okay? Now what about reflections? If your member of Congress says, I'm concerned the Prove It Act is just a step towards a carbon border adjustment, which I do not support. Well, here are a couple of reflections. And they're both, you know, legitimately reflecting what this person just said. The first one says, what I hear you saying is you do not support a carbon border adjustment. The second one, what I hear you saying is that your concern is about a carbon border adjustment, not specifically the Prove It Act. Now the first one is highlighting their lack of support for a carbon border adjustment. You're steering the conversation that way. Your reflection steers the stone that way, away from your target. The second reflection is actually creating a little bit of separation between carbon border adjustment and the Prove It Act, right? Creating a little daylight between the two and this very subtly steers the conversation that way. What about this example? Your member of Congress says, what remains to do on permitting reform leaves no room for bipartisan compromise. What kind of reflection could you offer to that? Well, here's a couple, and again, I think they're both legitimate in that they both reflect something about what they just said. The first one is, what I hear you saying is, there's no point in pursuing further permitting reform. And the second is, what I hear you saying is, you'd be encouraged by signs of bipartisanship on permitting reform. The first one is taking a highlighter to their sense of hopelessness. We don't really want to highlight that. We don't want the conversation to go down that road. The second one is actually doing an interesting thing where you take a negative and you turn it into a positive, right? They're saying, oh, we can't get bipartisanship on that. And you say, it sounds like you'd be encouraged if we could get some bipartisanship on that. And this might actually prompt them to think, hmm, maybe I've seen some signs of bipartisanship. And so again, you're just nudging that stone very gently towards the target. Notice that all of this subtle influence is not happening because you're expressing an opinion. It's not about your opinion. This is about what you hear them saying, and you're just picking out the parts of what they're saying that support our efforts, and we're highlighting it. And that in itself directs the conversation towards the goal of support for the bills we're lobbying for. Now, when you do want to share your own ideas, in motivational interviewing, there is a technique for that, and the idea is first you ask permission to share. And that might be as simple as saying, well, may I respond to what you just said? This is a very polite thing to do, and it tells the speaker that you are willing to keep listening if they're not done talking. 
And when they do give you permission, then you want to share your own ideas briefly and succinctly, and then ask them what they think about what you just said, so you can go back to listening. Now, sharing your idea briefly is really important. I think the most common mistake that we all make in lobby meetings is we talk too much. So here's a fun exercise that you can try to try to train yourselves to be briefer in the way you talk about legislation. I want you to think about the English language version of a Japanese haiku. That's 17 syllables over three lines in the form of five syllables and then seven and then five. And can you write, <laughs> can you write a haiku about the bills we're lobbying on? So, I mean, for example, you might write, gathering data on the emissions content of various goods. Now, this is never, <laughs> this is never gonna win a poetry prize, but this is 17 syllables that I think is a pretty good description of the Prove It Act. So I want to introduce you to you now the first ever CCL legislative haiku challenge. <laughs> we have four categories for each of our four asks, and you all have the opportunity to write your own haiku and submit them by 1.30 p.m. tomorrow, and then you get to vote on your favorite poems and voting will continue till 5 p.m. Tuesday, and we will announce the winners at the reception Tuesday night. You can submit your poems and vote at cclusa.org slash haiku. <laughs> now, a year ago, we practiced reflective listening in this room, and afterwards, two people Different people, different parts of the room approached me and said, the people at my table were practicing reflective listening in an aggressive manner. <laughs> <laughs> now, the only way you can do that is if you're not coming from the MI band of emotions, right? Well, if you're coming from a place of anger or you think the other person is stupid or wrong, then that's what's gonna happen. It's gonna come out like it's aggressive. So, so once again, you know, the, the important thing is getting yourself in the right emotional place. But when I think about practicing reflective listening in an aggressive manner, it makes me think about cats. <laughs> now, some of you may have had this experience, and if not, I think you could probably imagine this. You've got a beloved house cat, and one day you're coming home, and maybe you've got your arms full of groceries, and as you come in the front door, the cat slips between your legs, gets outside, and disappears. And you might be tempted to drop your groceries and run outside, chasing the cat, shouting its name. But if you did that, you'd probably soon learn that this is a poor strategy. <laughs> because cats tend to run away from people who are running after them and shouting. <laughs> and cats are faster than you. So a much better strategy is to go outside with a bowl of your cat's favorite food, sit down quietly somewhere, maybe where the cat can see you, and let the cat come to you. Now, I think members of Congress are like cats. <laughs> if you chase after them shouting, you will never catch them. A better strategy is to bring a bowl of your member's favorite food into their office, Sit there quietly and let them come to you. <laughs> now, we all know cats are really finicky about food, very particular about it. And so are members of Congress. Some members of Congress really love the smell of climate action. <laughs> so you could bring that kind of food into their office. Some members of Congress really don't like that smell at all they might be more drawn to the delicious scent of grid reliability. <laughs> or maybe the enchanting aroma of international trade negotiations that favor the United States. But the important thing is you need to know 
what your members' favorite food is and bring that food to your lobby meetings and then let your members of Congress come to you. Now, I want to do a brief review of my brief review. <laughs> Lobbying is subtle, like curling. Empathy, acceptance, curiosity, and compassion are a necessary foundation to our work. Use open-ended questions and reflections to evoke change talk or support for climate-friendly legislation. If you're coming from the right emotional place, use this handle. What I hear you saying is, ask for permission before you share, be brief, and then, maybe most important, bring a bowl of your member's favorite food into their office and then let the cat come to you. <laughs> Are there any questions back there, Flannery? John, you are so wonderful that we've clapped through our question time. <laughs>